Bingo. All right. So this is Shepard Ferry's famous Barack Obama campaign poster from 2008. He was not paid to do the poster. He donated it to the Democratic National Committee. Uh, they made a ton of copies of it and sent it out to donors. And it, soon it was everywhere. He also made, um, I think he spent, oh, I forget, like $1,500 of his own money or something making posters that he just put up around San Diego. But then he gave the digital file of it out so that people could print it anywhere they wanted and it was posted everywhere. And so it became a big kind of guerrilla campaign symbol of the 2008 campaign. And he is a street artist and he has a great documentary up on um, Netflix right now I encourage you to see. But what he did is basically the project that we're going to do <laughs> and hopefully not get sued for, for a second exercise. He found this photo of Barack Obama online. And his process is, and this is his process as a stencil street artist, he goes to Kinko's, he Xeroxes the photo, he does a small printout of the photo if he gets it online, he Xeroxes it and scales it up to be quite large. This poster is, I think, um, around 24 by 36 inches. So standard, like, big movie poster size. And then he takes an X-Acto knife, and he cuts out of his big Xeroxes, he makes multiple big scale taped copies. He cuts out the shapes he wants to use. He uses those cutouts as stencils for what's called ruby lift, which is this red film vinyl material that you use in stenciling for silk screen. You then put that on a silk screen, you expose it to light with a photo emulsion, and it makes the stencil into the silk. So the ink goes through where where you want the ink to go through, and it's blocked where you want it to be blocked. And then he did a, a three-color silk screen with three inks on cream-colored paper. He used a light blue ink, and that was his first screen with shapes. Then he used the red ink, that was his second screen. And then he used the dark blue ink, that was his third screen. And you get this image. But ultimately, what did he do? He took an image that already exists, and he found his own shapes over it to simplify it, make it clear. That is what our next exercise is. It's to take something that already exists, and I would recommend something that's art historical in nature. I shouldn't have pushed my luck. Let's see. So let's say um, this Picasso painting. Picasso's not going to sue you, like the Associated Press sued Shepard Ferry. Oh, now it doesn't. But you aren't required to. Or you could use Edvard Munch's The Scream. And you're going to make your own version of it. Using shapes. <laughs> so that's the art historical reference. And then that's the shape tools reference. But we're not going to be cutting it out of a Xerox and using Ruby Lift and using different color inks on a silk screen. We're going to use shape tools digitally in Photoshop. But just like Barack Obama's example, we want our shapes to feel intentional. We want them to be simple in the fact that they're either filled in with a color or they're not. Right? We're not going to have gradients. We're not going to have lots of muddied color. I want you to think of this as cutting out shapes from a, a block of construction paper. So you can cut out any shapes you want, and you can fill them with any color you want. But the combination of all those should be your version of a, an image you find. <laughs> so the first step in this is a Google image search, where we try to find a cool image that's also simple enough that it will work well with this kind of minimalist approach. So Ali Moss has made a, a good career as a designer doing this, um, using really simple shapes and imbue them with a lot of meaning. But notice he's not showing a scene from Robocop where there's 12 characters, right? Or a big city skyline in the background. 
He's not using a portrait of Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry when he's like gunning down bad guys. And there's smoke trailing from his gun and there's shadows. So it's, it's kind of about finding an image that you think can be simplified well. So I'm going to do that quick. And I'm going to use, um, I like to introduce you to artists that I enjoy. I'm going to use a character designer this time. And I'm going to use Sean Galloway, whose pen name is Cheeks. And he's been a freelance character designer for a long time. And even though these aren't art historical, he's worth knowing, especially if you're interested in animation, if you're interested in character design. Uh, my favorite professional job he did is for the Spectacular Spider-Man. He does all their character designs, and they modeled the whole animation Bible off of his designs. So he has a great way of working. And it's fairly minimal. right? It's very shape-based. So what can I do? Let's take a, a cool kind of fan art piece that he did because he never asks permission to do his versions of things unless he's getting paid. So let's take his Hulk. doesn't matter what resolution it is. I want you to find an image that you want to simplify into shapes. And it doesn't matter if it fills a whole rectangle or if it's a free-floating kind of PNG image like this, right? Spot illustration. And I'm going to show you how we can simplify in Photoshop with shapes. If I were going to choose an art historical one, let's see, I might choose an, an artist like Andy Warhol. You know, a pop artist who tended towards simplifying with shapes as well and use silkscreen like Shepard Fairey does. Let me take one of his pieces. You see how digital artists have done this themselves. And how could I simplify it with shapes like this one? It's almost already done for you, so maybe that's too easy. So let's take another pop artist, a West Coast pop artist that's amazing at color theory, Wayne Tebow. Right? And if I take, ah, something like this, something with interesting colors, oh, these would be nice. But you see how his paintings rely on the brush strokes and on the subtlety of the oil paint. I could do this as a shape composition, but I think it will still translate. It will be nice and graphic, and it will be kind of its own thing, but still represent the, the same content. So I'll let you guys vote. Which one do you want me to simplify as shapes? What, what would be more helpful to you? Okay, I have a vote for the Hulk. Raise hand if you want the Hulk. All right, raise hands if you want the watermelon. All right, I'm doing the Hulk. So, I'm glad we can all see that Hulk design is art. Right. Wayne Tebow stuff sells for, I went to a, a gallery not too long ago in New York that represents him. Uh, his cheapest paintings are over $40,000. Whereas Sean Galloway, he gives his stuff away free online because <laughs> he uses that Hulk piece to try to get professional jobs. So that's the difference between digital artist and traditional artist. Okay, now what do I do? I've got that image. Doesn't matter what the resolution is for it. I'm going to open it with Photoshop. Next, I am going to make it into a print quality resolution. Always start with the end in mind. Always know what you want out of it. And we want this to be a, a high-end print. So we go to image, image size, whatever it is, we are going to resample it. And because we can pick whatever we want, I want this to be at least 14 inches wide, your image. And because I'm actually probably going to crop it down, because I don't need so much white space, crop it down like that. Go to image size. I want that to be at least 14 wide. And that's a little bit better. That's closer to 11 by 14, which is a standard size. And then I want its resolution to be, what is our lab resolution? 350 pixels per inch. So unfortunately, when I did that, it changed it because I didn't recheck resample. <laughs> now it will let me change the pixels. So 350 at 14 by 11.25.
you can see in the preview, it's going to really soften the image. That's fine. Because we're going to be replacing all of this with our own shapes. So does that look high quality? No. But it's the resolution we need for our own shapes that we're making. That's the equivalent of Shepard Ferry going to Kinko's and blowing up a bad printout. It doesn't matter that blowing it up makes it look cruddy. He just needs it to be able to cut out his shapes. Okay, now I've got the full resolution file. I am going to start using what are called shape tools. And you are only allowed to use shape tools for this project. You are not allowed to draw. You are not allowed to use your lasso. You can only use the shape tools because these are vector tools within Photoshop. And this is my way of introducing you slowly to vectors in a safe way. So if I click on the shapes until the drawer opens, it gives me the rectangle, the rounded rectangle, the ellipse, the polygon, the line tool, and the custom shape tool. I have to find shapes that will make up this image. I want to start with big, basic, simple shapes, right? So I'm going to start with a big ellipse. And notice I'm not, I haven't even made a new layer, right? I'm just on the background layer, but I'm using the shape tool. I'm going to click and drag an ellipse tool. That kind of fills up a, some important space. Okay. Notice what the shape tool does. As soon as I let go, it makes a new layer, but this is what's called a shape layer. And because it has that little icon in the corner, we know there's something special about this layer. It's not just pixels. This layer is pixels outputted from a vector path within Photoshop. And we want to keep it that way. It also allows me, if I double click, double left click on the, the layer thumbnail, I can change the color to whatever I want. And you can see how that can be pretty helpful. All right, now I'm gonna use the shape tool again. Again, I'm not making a new layer. I wanna make a new ellipse. This time more vertical. But this time I wanna transform it. You are allowed to transform your shapes. Just like you did with your cartoon jumble, you hit Command T, you get a transform box that allows you to rotate it, that allows you to you know, push and pull it, scale it. And if you right click within it, it allows you most importantly to warp it. To be kind of a custom shape. Right? So if I turn off my background layer, I now have two shapes, both the same color, but at any time I could change the color to something else. And I need to keep them as shape layers. The reason I want to keep them as shape layers, which are made with a vector path, which is highlighted in blue, is because as shape layers, like smart objects, which we played with before, if I scale this up with resolution, the shapes will perfectly scale with it. Does that make sense? So right now they're at the right printing resolution. But if I decide, oh, I want it bigger than 11 by 14, I want it to actually be billboard size, you know, or maybe a full print size, which is 30 by 40 inches. So 40 inches wide at 350. Notice what happened to the Hulk drawing is not, and the, this softening of the pixels is not going to happen to my shapes because the shapes are drawn with a vector. They are not drawn with pixels. That is the magic of vectors. So they're a lot bigger now. <laughs> If I zoom in, they are still perfectly clean, matching whatever resolution I give it. So I can go infinitely higher, and I'll never get a softened edge. But watch what, what that distortion did to my Hulk graphic. So now those edges look way worse. Like they've been doused in water. But I don't need it to be 30 by 40 inches. I need it to be 11 by 14 inches. So I'm going to keep it there. But my shapes are going to be just as clean as long as I keep them as shape layers at any resolution. All right. So this is how we get started. You find an image. You start building shapes on top of it. 